Hello there everybody and welcome to my basic guide for Gordian Quest. I'm Icon and this video will guide you through everything you need to know to enjoy this game. You will find the timestamps for the different topics of this video in the description box below, so if you're looking for something in particular, go check them out. We're going to start here with a basic summary and then we're going to go over the meat and the potatoes of this game, explore the mechanics, explain how everything works. So, Gordian Quest is a party-based deck-building RPG, which revolves around a turn-based combat system, exploration, storytelling, and it sits somewhere in between a classic RPG with a party that you develop and a story that's been told, and a roguelite, roguelike uh, deck builder on the other side, which uh, is making up a lot of the system how the actual combat skill involvement works. It's a lot of fun, we're going to go over it, the concepts work really well together, and you have a lot of things to discover with this one. So, before we go into anything else, I want to start and explain and explore the combat of this game before we head on over all the other mechanics there, because all in all, Combat makes up at least 50% of this game, if not even more. So let's get started with that. The map you see here, I'm going to explain that later during the exploration phase. But for now, this is just the vehicle to get us into the first combat. So, you have always a party of three people, and you have to beat up an enemy party. So unlike other games of this genre, you're not going to build up a one-man army, you're building up a party. So as we see here on the left side are our guys, right side the evil guys. Red fields are the op uh, opponents, blue fields are ours. We see up here how the turn order of our guys will go. We see higher, the higher the better, and we got our character here who's going to act next. Here in the lower left corner you see the action points and the synergy points and here's our handful of things we can do. A couple of consumables are sitting down in the lower right bottom uh, corner and we can end a turn. The expended and discarded cards are being shown there. There's nothing too spectacular there. What's really important to note here is the enemy side. You see there's the HP of the enemy, HP of your guys. If any of these go zero, particular person is dead. Below there you see the enemy intent. So you see this spider intends to gain guard. This guy is concealed and this guy is trying to attack people that are go sitting in this column, and as you see, this guy here is blinking too, so he's going to be the target of, a, of this attack as well, dealing 8 damage. You can here see how the enemies are going to act, and you also all see when you mouse over them where they are sitting in the initiative bar. So we now know that we either have to kill off this guy, protect this guy, or move him away from this attack until this fella gets to act. Every enemy, when you click him, you can also see his uh, particular actions that he has available. You see what kind of effects are lasting on him. And also, if the enemy has something at the right from his uh, HP bar, that's a special perk that elite enemies tend to have. Up here you see Hellfreak the Wendigo is everything which has a name is actually an elite enemy. And he also has resistances and weaknesses, you can also read them out there, so every enemy is resistant and vulnerable against certain damage types. So far, so good. Pretty standard stuff if you are into these types of games, but I wanted to go over it in detail. So, the cards we see here are here depicting the cost, their range, their rank, their name, and their description. The color coding you see here is linked to the attribute of that skill. Green is dexterity, red is strength, blue is intelligence. There are only these three stats. So combat is being beyond that pretty easily explained. We can we pick up that card, click down there, and you see here there's a uh, preview about the damage we'll do. So let's do this. 40 damage there, 
And of course, there's lots of mechanics linked to these cards. This guy, for example, is stacking up agility, agility stacks and uses them up with his skills. There's a lot of mechanics linked to each character. Mages have different mechanics than rogues, than fighters, and, the, and so on and so forth. But it's all being explained in these text boxes, and I'm certainly gonna do an advanced guide video about the combat, but this would really go too far for this video. What's really important to know is that you have this kind of actions, and also you have the synergy bar. You see, this card here has this purple gem, and that means it's a synergy card. Synergy points last between combats, the blue action points only last for one turn. And these synergy spells, well, they are something special. Sometimes you get them as a level up reward, sometimes you get them via items. Don't uh, think that they are exclusive to some source, but they use a different resource. That's the important part about synergy cards. And beyond that, well, you can move your people by just uh, clicking to the square you, where you want to move them and then click twice to go for that. This guy here has agility stacks and agility stacks can be used for movement. If you don't have any agility stacks, movement costs you action points. One action point per grid. And then you end your turn and then stuff goes on and on and on and that's basically what the combat's going on like. So the real cool part about all this and what I'm really enjoying about it is the fact that there's party play. The enemies are a party, you guys are a party, and there is no one-man army gameplay, and I'm really enjoying this. This is for me one of the coolest parts about this game. The character classes have all different synergies with each other. There are into a total of 10 different classes to play in the combat. You get to play three at once, so there's a lot of uh, pers uh, crossover happening. I want to leave the combat topic at this point and head on over to the other topics. So we're going to go over next to the gear development of our characters. Now, there we are. This is what a standard character sheet of your guys looks like. These guys are pretty much well equipped, but level 14 is just just above the very early stage of the game, so these characters are basically still beginner characters. So you see, your dudes can wear a lot of items. There's slots for lots of different uh, things here, body armor, gloves, and so on and so forth. These items all provide different bonuses, ranging from stat bonuses to things that apply to your cards on your hand, things to that apply to your uh, to your challenges, because there are also event-based challenges, and so on and so forth. You can also gain new skills via these items, and every item can have runes attached to them. You see here there's these sockets with different colors, and runes can fundamentally change how an item works. Runes either add in a new effect to the item or to the attached skill. As you see here, good example is this hat here. You can attach one skill there. The um, Shield icon says it's supposed to be a defense skill. As you see here, every skill has tags associated to them, and you can now attach that uh, that skill to an item. And if you now attach a rune that interacts with the attached skill on the item, you can change the skills of your characters. That's pretty cool stuff, and this allows you a lot of individualization on your items. These items can also be enchanted. You can enchant up every white item up to to the rare tier. They can also be disassembled into materials that allow you to upgrade things. And there are also legendary items. Whoopsie. We want your inventory, old man, and not there. Here. There's legendary items. That's basically the highest rarity tier. And these are extremely important because really a lot of your character's development is uh, coming from that. Your characters have, like I mentioned before, these three stats, strength, intelligence, and dexterity. And dexterity skills and strength skills and int skills are 
part of the decks of every character. Every character is basically able to go for every one of these attributes. You have to decide which focus you'll go for. For example, my monk here, I have focused into intelligence. My cleric, I have focused into strength. And my mage, I have focused uh, my cleric to dexterity. I wanted to say dexterity and intelligence, I'm sorry. Slip up all the words, but you get the idea. This is pretty good because you can use this as a means to get stronger attacks and stronger successes during the explorations. The cards of your characters, as you see here, this guy has a lot of green cards because he's a dexterity based character. And you see here there's this plus seven in the brackets. I paid a lot of attention to feed him with dexterity gear. Is now affecting his skills there as well. If you hold down control, left control, you can also see the total equation of these cards. As you see here, this skill deals 8 plus 100% of your dexterity mod plus what comes from the item's damage. So focusing into stats is really really good and items help you a lot by while well, for doing so. Items can be traded if you are playing the campaign in the outposts or if you're playing the skirmish or realm mode on different nodes. The offers these guys give you are always different and it really is worth checking them out. Gold is therefore a very very valuable resource. There's also Marco the Merchant. This guy is selling legendary gear. You can also meet him in the skirmish mode as far as I know. And legendary gear is different from the other gear in so far that it is pretty fixed in its stats. The weapon has a fixed name, it has a certain topic and theme to it, whereas blue items can be very, very different and sometimes also outshine the legendary counterparts. So. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. The only thing left to mention is you have 200 item slots in your party and you are also able to stash some of those in the campaign mode down there at the guild hall. So you either sell them, dismantle them or stash them. And that's how you work out with character gear. You really should work on filling the character slots as well as you can because basically this is just uh, wasted attribute bonuses if you not do so. Okay, next thing on my list is deck building. So you see here we have all these cards, everybody has his cards, but how does this uh, actually come together? First off, these skills are originating from the items you have on yourself and also from the items that you have picked up on the skill grid. I'm going to explain the skill grid in a second but let's stick for stick with the um, deck building part for a second there before we go for the skill grid. So all these cards here are the ones that you have currently equipped. There's the edit deck um, function and you see here I have 19 of 12 cards. That means the minimum size of this deck is supposed to be 12. We have now 19 cards and we could trim that down by just clicking whatever we want to uh, remove from more deck here with the minus sign. But as you see here, a couple of skills can't be removed. That's because they are originating from gear. Gear-based skills can't be removed. You have to wear them around and therefore be careful, select carefully that the skills attached to your items are actually useful for that character. Otherwise you will be cluttering your deck with things that you actually don't want. So, unlike with other deck builder games, you don't need to work hard to get rid of these cards. You just can remove or add them to, as to your own liking until you have the deck size that you want. When you're building your deck, always take care that you have a good mixture of attacks, defensive skills and utility skills. What's really unique for this game is this game features here passive skills, intervention, which this skill has a certain trigger and remains on the hand of the character and will be used if that condition is met. Some cards are passive skills that basically you need to draw out of your deck and retain them on your hand. Everything which has the keyword retain 
does not just get discarded at the end of the turn and triggers and passive skills are parts of your deck that will enhance all the other cards or give you some interactions are lots of different things that are happening there but you should really aim for a good balance and also it is highly recommendable to stick to that 12 card um thing uh as or to your deck minimum size as close as possible because this makes the cards that you want to have show up more often and it's a real art form to trim your deck down to sizes that are appealing to you don't hound yourself just have fun experiment around and find the proper balance there so next thing that i want to talk about is the skill grid so the skill grid works like that we're going to pick up a new character because that's easier to show. So here in the guild hall, we can pick up and remove old characters. So let's pick up Ida. We haven't had her yet. So the skill grid looks at first like that. Your character gains a skill point with each level up, and you get to move across the board here. These nodes have different uses. You either can gain stat points, you learn new skills, you learn new talents, or you increase skill ranks for your mastering skills. So stat points are quite straightforward. You get to get and select something. Every second point gives you another point up in the bonus modifier. You pretty much should already define which stat your character is going to main. Ideally, you have one main and one secondary stat. Talent sockets work like that. If you use them, you get to slot in one of these passive skills. They are linked to the attributes and they can be only used if you have a minimum value of that attribute without skill nodes. So they range from a pure strength bonus over to bonuses when you're using certain types of gear over to a shift that allows you to use dex skills better even if you are maining strength. There's a lot of variety there. The cool thing about the talents is out of combat you can just select one, swap talent, and you don't need to think too long about these. These are temporary choices and you're unlocking the slot. Out of combat you can assign that slot always new. And when you're selecting a new skill you always get to select between three paths of your character thing here is every character has three paths most of the time they correlate to either a certain theme a certain stat or both in some way so as you see here this one has featured was featuring a lot of um, this one is featuring more intelligence this other one had dexterity and intelligence and this one is definitely an, a very hot, hard on intelligence you see that on the color coding so I can only recommend you to for, for to go for a specific path and branch off for a couple of cards that you want to have. Whenever you select one of these, it's like a booster pack where you get to select three of these or more of these skills depending on the rank of this one of the node and then you either select, you either redraw with your fate points or you transform this choice into a respec point allowing you to just choose a new node somewhere else or respec a node so that's how you gain new skills via this and every couple of skill points you also gain a new skill grid and that's pretty funky there so now we get to select which skill grid we want to have every skill grid is uh, most of, or most of the time they are focused here you have two nodes for animal kinship two for elemental two for primal so they're pretty much biased towards a certain topic and when you select that now we get to decide where it should connect and you also see you can all only start to connect where you are already on the edge of this and this is a element of randomization which is really cool because you can't have that under your control and your skill board is a pretty lively place there are two things that i want to talk about skill mastery and skill upgrading so here increase skill rank and skill mastery every skill that your character has for himself i was looking for the right button there oh, here, here it is. every skill that your character has for himself has here a ranking 
and mastery choices. So when you unlock a node for rank up, you get to select one skill that's going to rank up. And I see here, while they rank up, they gain more and more power in their respective uh, way. So it's always different for those spells. And mastery allows you to choose one of those two nodes, but they're mutually exclusive. You can't have two masters on one skill. So you either choose one of you, this or that one, which will alter the card by itself. This way you can specialize your characters even more. Okay, so that's all I wanted to lose about the skill board. It's a fun instrument and I really, really enjoyed myself using that. Okay, next thing on my list are is the exploration thing and the dungeons. So this is the campaign board, Act 1 campaign, and I've already did a lot of things there. The skirmish mode has a little bit of a, or the realm mode has a little bit of a different layout, but it remains the same. You get to select where your people are going to walk towards to, and there are different things happening on, the, on those nodes, be it shrines that let you alter the encounters, Safe Passage, which gives you supplies and heals your party, places where you can go for exploration, places where you have encounters, and also dungeons. You can pretty much grind up this. If you go resting in the city, lots of these nodes will get refreshed, but as you see here, we only have 69 days. Or, let's see that correctly. Yeah, we only have 69 days until we lose the game there in this campaign mode. What's really important there is you're carrying around supplies and you need those to travel around and if your supplies are empty you need to replenish those unless uh, otherwise i think your party is taking damage every time you are traveling i haven't made it uh, haven't uh, had trouble with that so often and apart from that pretty much a no-brainer i want to explain how exploration works and then we're going to go over the dungeons real quick so exploration is a pretty unique feature of the game. Exploration squares, they look like that. And they open up this little mini game here where you can, you have four points where you, which you can move and there's uh, random stuff that you can go for and there's a monster. So you get to plot down where you want to move. So we we'll want to move on this one. Kachi. And here we got some upgrade material. Here's somebody, there's a potion merchant that we can wander on. And you get to travel here until your markers are gone and you can pick up things. What's really interesting about the monsters is if you walk onto them, you lose a part of your HP, but you also gain a random node. But you can also move on top of these monsters like this. Make sure that you're not interacting with the monster. So if it's lit, you're interacting. If it's not lit, you're not. I'll check it out. And now the monster ain't moving anymore. You can still trigger it by moving on it, but it won't chase you anymore. Now you can just finish that up, and that's exploration nodes. Once you have used all your markers, you get to go back there. That's all. Dungeons are all these entries here that you see like these, and the they are basically always working like a entirely new area with new events that can spawn there. What I can't really explore here right now are events. There are basically a little bit of a text passage where you get to do a little bit of a skill challenge. And oh, here's one. Perfect. So, Brines. If you use those, you get to alter the nodes. So, these work like that. You will spread positive things and negative things across the encounters all across the map. You can use incense to spawn more of these, and then you pray, and then they get spread over the map. Now you can see, these are now altered nodes. You don't know if a positive or a negative effect will, go, will come on that uh, node. So, campsites allow you to rest. Let's use that real quick. Add the campsite. Every character has his own skill set. You have 12 hours to do something. And you see here our monk can transform fate into these uh, things. Our hunter can transform supplies into something. You can pitch up a tent. You can increase skill rank masteries. You can forage. There's a lot of things that you can do during the 
camping sessions and what's really important to note is there's also exhaustion certain events in the game allow you to exhaust cards they won't be getting drawn anymore and you can usually get yourself a bonus by destroying these cards temporarily exhaustion gets uh, mostly destroyed by camping here pitch a tent or gain exhaustion by doing things uh, on the campsite. What's really important is just read the tooltips there and pay attention that you have to pay for these things and you can only do them as long as you have time here. Once the time's ran through, you're done with camping. And now events, last but not least. Events are usually a little bit of a text. We came across a caravan and we can now make a strength check with one hero. Let's do this. So you see here also the chances of a success. It's always uh, auto-selecting the most uh, likely success uh, succeeding champion. You see here the necessary score we need to hit. We see here by how much the role will be modified. We can now pick a skill like I mentioned. And you see here, if I'd be picking up now like shield block, I would modify my role by a further plus five. And the skill would then be exhausted for the time being. Let's roll. And we didn't make it by the roll, but the bonuses were kicking in. So you see here, up here is Fate. Fate is a random currency that can be used to reroll stuff, mostly. You are receiving Fate very randomly, and therefore use it whenever the odds are for you that bad that you won't bother lasting through that okay so last thing that i want to talk about is renown and the most basic uses for that renown is basically your meta progression currency the most obvious usage for renown is you can unlock artifacts with those artifacts are things that you you see there's 65 of them you unlock them randomly and you have here slots where you can equip artifacts it works like that every artifact has a permanent bonus that's the one here in gray refining a legendary item costs one less soul spark salvaging well, let's put it up there and uh, you can get the one up there the light gray one so whenever i salvage something i get a extra resource the dark gray one needs to be unlocked most if these can be upgraded in this way and the red one is an activation effect so every artifact that's equipped up here gains the light gray bonus and nothing else or if you have unlocked the one below there as well so here the tempest orb gives all my heroes lightning resist if i would not equip it i would have the chance to find a lightning orb in my future adventures which acts as a consumable which crafts lightning resist on a common or magic item. All these things are working like that. If you equip them up here, they give you a passive bonus for the remainder of your campaign. And if you don't equip them up there, there's a chance that they drop somewhere and you can use them as a activatable item. So in every case, unlocking these artifacts is a good thing for you. And now you pretty much know all the basics about the game. You will explore that there's lots of combos every character has as you've seen there lots of different uh, varieties especially due to the fact that your character every character has these three paths and they really differ just to give you an impression there for the cleric there is a fighter type specialization a healer type specialization and a magic damage dealer type specialization so you can really get a lot of different things out of your characters depending on how you want to play it. So there's really, really, really a lot of replayability, let alone to the fact, due to the fact that you can play those guys so damn differently. Now, I hope you enjoyed that one, found that helpful. Leave me your comments down below. If you have any further questions or things you want to see, you want to see covered more deeply, let me know. And leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed. And of course, consider subscribing. There's daily content coming up on my channel. And I'd be delighted to have you. In the description box, you'll not only be finding the timestamps I've been talking about, but also other helpful links. So there's a Discord channel where I hang out and other like-minded gamers as well. And there's also my Twitch channel where I do stream quite regularly. And last but not least, there are also links 
for direct support for my channel. My content will always be free. I'll never do any paywalled content, so I can use all the help I can get. And I thank you so much for watching this video up to this very point. It means a lot to me. So, have a wonderful day, and see you soon. Bye-bye.